Hi, I'm John, the MedPod Engineer Termel, and this is part three of my goodies in Svetkopoulos Supreme Court documentation, where I got a buddy to go dig out the background documents out of the Supreme Court of Canada registry and get the Crown's words on what the true meaning of the Svetkopoulos decision is, which is certainly not what you read in the press. Part three. So, now we go on to the order, which is, it is ordered the judgment of the Federal Court of Appeal made October 27th is hereby stayed pending further order with this court. Now, note those words, pending further order with the court, are six words we've seen before in our dealings with Crown Attorney David Frankel. This time, it's going to be a bigger dog to bite him. It strengthens Terry's Krieger card before Judge Tullock. This is the exact wording used by Alberta Justice O'Leary in staying the effect of the Krieger invalidation of Section 7 Cultivation Prohibition, which let Crown Attorney David Frankel argue that the Krieger invalidation never took effect because the stay pending further order survived the further order upon dismissal of their appeal and still needed to be lifted. Of course, once the appeal is dismissed and the court becomes functus officio, no motions may be made to lift the stay. So Frankel's foible results in the Krieger invalidation being stayed forever. Now, here at the Supreme Court, the execution of the Svetkopoulos invalidation of the MMAR was stayed pending further order with the court, which I argued is a standard phrase, not a prime order, and now the Supreme Court has dismissed their case. Can the Crown now argue the Frankel foible that the stay still needs to be lifted even though motions can't be filed after the court's functus officio? And ergo, the Svetkopoulos invalidation is stayed forever a la Krieger. Well, of course, I doubt they will raise the Frankel foible to argue the Svetkopoulos decision remains stayed forever because a stay pending further order with the court survives the final order of the court and still needs to be somehow lifted. The Frankel foible arguing a stay pending appeal needs to be lifted after the appeal is dismissed before the Krieger invalidation took effect has been exposed by this analogous situation at the Supreme Court as baseless and strengthens Terry's ground that the prohibitions on cultivation and possession were invalidated by Krieger in early 2003, making for a seamless interval of invalidity between Terry Parker Day and now. A third flaw in the prohibition has been strengthened. Feeling rosier, Michael? So finally, on April 23, 2009, the Supreme Court of Canada dismissed the Crown's application for leave to appeal. And all the things the Crown says they fear will come true have hopefully come true. Of course, even though they should stop prosecutions, they're going to keep the machine slicing through the population until a judge of Superior Court comes to that conclusion officially. And, of course, Justice Tullock's the first one to be asked. Isn't it incredible how much good stuff can be dug out of the background material that no one ever expected anyone but the judges to ever read? <laughs> What's interesting is that despite the claims of national importance from the fear that the law will be declared invalid since 2003, with another 300,000 bogus convictions to deal with, the Supreme Court still rejected their appeal. Of course, they didn't expunge the 100,000 bogus convictions during the Parker two years of invalidity, and the Supreme Court even helped with the cover-up when it was pointed out to them. So they must figure, the Crown, that they'll refuse to expunge the next 300,000 bogus convictions during the Svetkopoulos interval of invalidity too. The Supreme Court of Canada did nothing to correct the record the last time 100,000 bogus convictions were registered, and it was pointed out. So who bets they'll do anything to correct the record this time? Uh, with the 300,000 bogus convictions pointed out. And still being registered since April the 23rd when it became official. They're still busting people out there. My supplementary written representations on the Svetkopoulos MMAR invalidity, rendering the marijuana prohibitions in the CDSA have no force in effect, 
Two Superior Court Justice Tullock will be filed in Brampton on Monday. Sorry, Derek, if I had to focus on winning it for everyone, but just sit back and know you're legal of all sorts of medical and non-medical reasons. So whether you closely follow MMAR regulations on supply issues can't be much of a worry, especially when they now know tangling with you is a war of attrition with them on the expensive end. It's actually time for everyone who can to go for the kill. The Crown didn't say how many cases it feared were being fought on this issue below, but it's going to be more and more. Sure, it's a stupid gimme kind of win. Prohibition is off because of flimsy grower regulations, rather than solid too long odds of finding a doctor, or solid Pulkoa with Parker and Krieger invalidations. But if Health Canada wants to make a stupid move to gimme their ball in, the own egg zone, in their own end zone, who am I to not have Terry Parker take it, sit down, and score? What an ending to the Parker saga. The first Superior Court declaration of Section 4 being declared no longer known to law by the same guy who got the appeal court ruling that Section 4.1 was invalid. What serendipitous coincidence and timing that it be Terry Parker in court right now leading the final charge after having led the original charge and discovering a third nail to hammer in the prohibition's coffin is just icing on the cake. It's like having his last Svetkopoulos card popping up on the river to give him a royal flush. What theater? And the best part of it all is that visually, it's not just some guy disappearing after the charge is dismissed. It's the Crown handing over a pound of pot to Terry Parker. I'll have a camera there even if the media don't. So I'll always respect Terry for standing firm seven years ago when Alan Young and Crown Lara Spears tried to get him to swap Justice Pitt's constitutional exemption, quote, until the government complies with the court's ruling, for a Section 56 exemption from the Minister of Health, or Justice Chapnick's exemption without that declaration that the MMAR had failed to comply with the Parker ruling. So we know what Alan and Laura wanted to get rid of, don't we? That they didn't comply with the ruling. And we never lost the Pitt declaration, first out of the Superior Court, that the MMAR had failed to comply because Terry didn't take the bribe. And that enthused me into getting him to every court I could until we're now at the serendipitous point that Terry's going to win it for us all. Sorry if I'm gushing, but imagine how everything would be different today if he'd fallen for Allen's and the Crown's bribe. My hat's off to you, Terry. I'm just honored to have been given the privilege of engineering your armaments for you. When I think of how they robbed you of the credit in the Hitzig decision by changing the style of Crocs from appellant Terry Parker and others to respond in Hitzig and others, it's justice that you get the credit for the final kill, even if Alan robbed you of your name on the all-important Hitzig decision. Go look it up, anyone. After a justice had specifically titled the consolidated appeals as Terry Parker, Hitzig, and others, including me, after that, in the Carthy decision, you'll see the style of cause is Terry Parker, Hitzig, and others. But to give Alan Young credit for the score, the Ontario Court of Appeals surreptitiously changed it to Hitzig, Terry Parker, and others. Why would they switch names so the respondent gets credit and not the appellant who initiated the issue? It's quite the theater. And it's all recorded at nine years' worth of my blog. Interesting that the abolition of prohibition of marijuana may be taking place at the same time as my project to abolish interest rates takes root, with interest-free community currencies abounding all over the planet, and only a matter of time until they adopt the time standard of money and become compatible with each other. Imagine fixing usury and ending the prohibition of herb around the same time. Either will one will propel interest in the other, then maybe I can get them to legalize gambling and other joys in life.